so this portion of, of the event is uh, really just to talk a little bit about what we were doing with the uh, with the new talent bit in this program. Um, you know, we consciously started this uh, series starting at the beginning with uh, unsigned directors and talent that had not necessarily been given the same opportunities that people who are represented by film production companies or commercial production companies had. And the interesting thing for me is just the, um, the uh, path at which a director uh, follows to get to a point of being a successful director. So I'd like to introduce this evening um, two people. First I'd like to introduce A.J. Bond, whose film you saw in the program. Um, he has, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, he began as a film, a uh, child star rather, in Kitchen Party in 1997, I think the film that will follow you forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since then, he has, uh, he's a graduate of the UBC Film Program and the Canadian Film Centre. He worked uh, as a producer and short editor of short films, um, including the festival favourites, uh, Why the Anderson, Anderson Children Didn't Come to Dinner and the Patterns Trilogy, who was directed by... by by Jamie, by Travis, Jamie, who's, who's in, in the, the audience, audience as well. Um, Her Suit was his first uh, short film, and he's currently working on a second, uh, Madame Perrault's Bluebeard. Yeah, it's done, actually. Oh, it's done, and you're working on a feature film. Yeah. I'd also like to introduce Scott McKenzie, who has, uh, while we were sitting here, apparently signed every director in that program for Rad Key Films. Uh, a partner executive producer at Rad Key Films. He's been involved in films since 1978. Amazing you, amazing you admit that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> His, uh, he's worked on a whole host of, I had to, right? Um, music videos, feature films, documentaries, television specials, corporate films. Basically, he's done everything you can do in Canada and won, has won every international They're not award. directed because I'm afraid to. <laughs> Uh, so the conversation we're going to have right now is basically um, about, uh, you know, getting, getting established as a director in Canada and, and sort of what the interplay is between the formats you saw here. We saw films next to commercial or next to commercials, next to uh, music videos. If I could just ask quickly, how many people in this audience, I heard there might be quite a few students in the audience. Could you raise your hand if you're a student? Nice, okay, cool, thanks for coming. Um, I'm curious just because, uh, you know, I think it would be, it's good to know how many people are established and understand the industry versus people who are starting out. Um, so AJ, I want to start with you. Um, you know, we've had earlier conversations uh, prior to this, and one of the things that you mentioned in terms of your career as a filmmaker is that, you know, you, you said yours is a story. Yours, your story as a director is one of starting out. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, still trying to figure it out. Um, could you explain what that means a little bit? Well, I think both of those are true. Um, I started as an editor which I thought I wanted to do, and I actually went to the film center in the editing lab, and then I realized that I didn't want to be an editor, and I did producing, and then I realized that I wasn't very good at producing, so I'm kind of just finding my feet now as, I'm pretty sure directing is what I want to do, though it is horrible and stressful, so maybe I'll be wrong in a couple years. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really in the process of figuring out how to get representation still, how to really make a living doing it, um, and finding my voice, I guess, as a filmmaker. One of the things that um, was interesting to me in the advance of this screening is that there was, a, there was a press screening last week and some of the questions that came out of that press screening was curiosity from the mainstream people who don't work in this industry around the idea of having commercials and videos and short films juxtaposed or put all together in one program, which for anybody who's working in the industry seems rather, you know, normal. Um, you know, what do you think, the reality of a director, like how do you see these sort of uh, formats playing together? There's definitely a sort of schizophrenia that happens because it really is about who you're doing the project for. So if I'm doing a short film, that's probably out of any of the projects I'm doing the most personal because even a feature film is going to have investors and distributors breathing down your neck. So that's like freedom to do what you want. But then a music video, and I haven't done commercials really, but... I imagine you, it's I'll the same. I'll tell you the truth about commercials. When you're <laughs> clients. You, you have clients. You have bands. You have labels. And suddenly you're working for other people. And that really is a difficult balance compared to, oh, uh, on my short, I got to do whatever I wanted. And it, and it worked out the way I wanted. And in a music video, it's, it's not quite like that. So I really think you have to kind of wear these kind of different hats about who you are working for. Um, but I, I don't know, it was interesting, even for me it was odd, I felt like, I think that's the first time I've ever clapped after a commercial, it'd be interesting. That's how I always watch TV. 
Speaking for the commercial side, how many people here work in the commercial business? Hands up. Okay, a few, a few criminals. So the difference between AJ and I is that when AJ's fellow cuts his head off, I was sort of thinking of an Evian logo in the back of the bathtub. <laughs> when the little masturbator was by the girl in the bus stop, I sort of looked and saw a McDonald's logo on the cup. So the, the difference for us is we're in the business of creative. So on the commercial side, what we do is we take somebody like AJ and we actually teach him how to work for a client because our our stories are 30 seconds long. I think that maybe 75% of what we saw actually could be a commercial. Um, if it was cut the right way, if it was shot the right way, but it would unfortunately corrupt what he wanted to do or they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of business than film or teach or short film or documentary because it is a business. We work for somebody. We work for GM or we work for McDonald's or we work for whoever pays us to work for them. Well, Scott, that's an interesting point because the MTV piece that was in there um, was actually a short film first and somebody, the powers that be at MTV saw it and actually commissioned it as a, a brand spot and then cut it down. Yeah. What, do you see that happening often? How, can you speak uh, to that? I, I think that what commercials do sometimes is mimic what culture is about at, the, at that point in time. So. If Thor comes out as it does this week, I'll see five boards from 10 people who are here tonight that feature a blonde guy throwing a hammer, wearing no shirt. So that's part of what advertising does is mimic. The other side is it wants to sort of engage you, the audience, and they'll do anything they can to get your attention. They'll co-opt anything that they can. They will try and trick you. They will try and fool you. And it's not it's not meant to be belittling. It's not meant to, to sort of be, maybe criticize what culture is about, be it a movie, a film, art. I mean, we're, we're in town today shooting with Harmony Corinne. We're doing a three-day shoot with him. This is a fellow that did uh, Kids, the movie Kids, as a, as a teenager. He did Gummo. He did uh, Julian Donkey Boy. So we're on set, and after he had shot two children, spit on the client, and told them that their product was killing people in the third world, we actually got the day done. <laughs> but here is a director who is known as a feature guy who has been doing commercials for three years, and I have a very happy, we have a very happy client. We'll get the spot done. But it shows that you can bring that kind of talent into the commercial world and be successful at it. And he does it so that he can do, he, he does commercials so that he can make, he, he's allowed to make movies. So there is something good that comes out of it in the end. He actually spit on the client? No, he didn't. I was just <laughs> kidding. But, but there's still one more day. <laughs> you can hope. We can hope. Well, AJ, from your perspective, I mean, you know, you hear, you hear Scott talking and it, it's, it's rather, you know, severe and wildly manipulative. Um, you know, <laughs> do you... As somebody who's starting out and has aspirations to be a film director, but also, you know, there's realities of, of getting paid, you know, mm -hmm. which, you know, the greatest creative endeavors in this world rarely pay, sadly. I mean, what's your thought on, on hearing that kind of thing? Uh, it, it's a little bit intimidating, but it's, it doesn't, I feel like the discipline that would go into making a commercial with a client could only be really valuable in your feature work because... It's, you still have a lot of people to please, but you get to have a, maybe a little bit more freedom when you're doing a feature film. But I feel like, yeah, to work and have that kind of discipline, to be Harmony Korine and then to be making a commercial is really surprising to me, and I feel like it could only kind of improve what he's doing. And the idea, what's obvious, is that Harmony Korine is not making money making feature films. Uh, I don't know if you saw Trash Humpers. It's not a very commercial film. Um, and I, I am becoming very aware that making independent films is not a living. And you hear that all the time. It's like, oh, it's an art. Um, but I, I do need to make a living. And I feel like commercials and music, less so music videos, commercials is probably maybe think, TV, the only way yeah. you can do that and be a director. I think that there is, you know, we're all good for each other. And I think the difference is we're telling a story in 30 seconds. And I think that if you're good at telling a story in two hours and you're good at telling a story in 30 seconds, you can do both.
and you can decide when you want to do it, and that's the advantage. But that, well, there's a couple of interesting things that I wanted to tap on. First, you know, we had a conversation earlier, and you mentioned when we talked about this program, Scott, um, about uh, unsigned directors and new talent and where new talent comes from. You mentioned that you almost have a bit of a, um, a preference to finding talent from agencies because they understand that world. I mean, but that's kind of in distinct contrast to what you just said. I think there's three kinds of directors. There's um, the reason that we would like a director from agency side is because they understand the culture, they understand branding and strategy. And when they're working for somebody like a McDonald's and they've been on the dark side of the agency, let's say, um, they are an easy sell. And the other kind of director we're looking for is a director like Harmony. Um, Harmony is very established. For us to take Harmony on when he was 17 years old would have been a disaster. Because at that point, he was just a wild kid. He literally uh, was 17 years old and living on rooftops in San Francisco. So um, we're parasitic or complementary. We, we, we would take him later in life, whereas we would take an agency creative who we think has a promise. We would take them when they have tired of the dark side and want to come over to the production side. The third type we would take would just be somebody who we think is incredibly talented and creative and uh, somebody who we think has an understanding and the ability to uh, work with and work for us together with client. And if you want to see who that is, about a month from now, check out a website called commongood.tv and you'll see what we think is part of the future for everybody. Okay. That's just a plug. That was yeah. an ad, but that's the business. <laughs> there you go. Thing. I mean, the future here, that's pretty bold. Um, <laughs> moving away from the future to the now, I mean, one of the things that, um, the other thing I said, there were two things I wanted to hit on was the idea that um, there's this, this tension between commercial filmmaking and, and commercial filmmaking and art filmmaking, yet we still talk about um, feature films and there's so many restrictions in feature films. Um, do you think there really is an art in filmmaking? Does it exist and where does it exist and how can you survive or how does that fit into a filmmaker's career? I think there's art in all, even in, you know, I haven't seen Thor, but I imagine there is a certain art to producing a really good action comic book movie. Maybe it's more of a craft, but I, I think that there's an art to that. But I think if you want to have freedom, then you, you're going to be making a film that is extremely low budget. Or you are someone like Harmony Korine who has such a body of work behind him that people are going to want to invest in that film because it's prestigious. So I think starting out, it's definitely either, and, and this is how I'm thinking now, I have a feature film that's a little bit more accessible and the budget is higher, and I have a feature film that is less accessible and the budget is much lower. And the one that's a lower budget is a little bit more appealing because it, it'll be a little bit freer, but it'll also be harder and it maybe won't be as good, who can say. Do we care too much about this notion of art in film? No, no. <laughs> I, I think we could care a bit more right about now. <laughs> I think that on my side, I think commercials are art, which is sort of drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit. But if you think about what it takes to do a commercial and how they're done and how they're crafted and how they're, they do reflect what is sort of happening for all of us in the present day, um, I think that they're very representative of what the, our culture is and what commercials do is sort of capture that. So you could go into the 70s, and if you watched the commercials from the 70s, you would see what the 70s was about. If you went to watch spots from the 80s, the MoMA in New York has a collection of commercials uh, in their library that are vaulted. So um, i probably go too far to the idea of commercials being art, but I do think that if you take a look through a year and you can go back and you can research what was happening at that time. Commercials would actually, inf you would see the influence and you would see what, what that pe time period was like. So I think that there is, you know, there is definitely art in, commercial, in commercials. Certainly a lot of the really high-end brands I've noticed, oh, yeah. like Dolce & Gabbana or, um, yeah. you know, those, there's some really interesting longer pieces and they have like yeah. prestigious directors doing that yeah. I would consider very artful. 
Yeah, and if you look at um, you look at Spike Jones doing Apple or Fincher, um, those big directors, th those are people that come into it with a definite idea of what they want to do, and they're seriously talented people. So you you know you sort of look at um, a Heineken ad that they've done, or Jonathan Glazer with this, the surfer stuff, the surfer ad. Those kinds of things, those are pretty serious artists, I think, working in the commercial world. So, AJ, as someone who really has a passion to be, you know, an artistic director, do you, do you, in your heart of hearts, feel as though, you know, advertising is a viable place to get that creative stimulation? Uh, I don't know if I, uh, and this is from a naive perspective, would get a creative stimulation from it, but I think I would get... Financial stimulation? Uh, not, but not just a financial, it would be more of a work stimulation, how to work with a bigger crew, how to work with a bigger budget, how to work with uh, different types of shots. It's like each commercial, you're do I have friends that do commercials and it's amazing. One, oh, I got to shoot in a car, I got to shoot in this, and it's just a, it's like a learning ground working with really talented crews and having a bit more money. It, it sounds like a great way to learn a lot of techniques that could be, you know, really inspiring for a, a more personal project. Mm -hmm. So that's, it does seem exciting in that way. You know, we talked earlier a little bit about being a director in Canada, and from what you said, and I'd like to expand on that a little bit, is it seems as though those opportunities might be something that you wouldn't get necessarily trying to be a feature film director in Canada. I mean, can you talk a little bit about that experience that you've had? Um, well, I'm trying to get a feature off the ground, and I have friends that have made first features, and it's really clear that from my my point of view, you can't make a living as a feature filmmaker in Canada making features. So pretty much any Canadian director that you can think of, even the big ones, are actually making money doing commercials or TV. And that's something that's been really surprising to me uh, because you kind of have this notion like, oh, well, once, once I make my first Canadian feature, I'm going to, everyone, I'll like somehow make a lot of money and I'll get off. But it's, it doesn't really work like that. I think I'm starting to think now about how to split up my career. I edit still to make money and I make my own projects because I want to and so I'm already thinking of you know going down certain paths to make money and then going down feature filmmaking paths because I want to and the the irony is that it's it's more prestigious you making a feature will help your actual you know money making TV directing stuff um, but you just won't be able to survive off of it mm -hmm. I asked you the question about filmmaking as whether or not it needs to be less artful to be a little bit provocative, because it does seem as though we're in a bit of a, a very homogenous state of, of film, at least mass film. You know, and there's often, you know, Scott, we would know that in the advertising industry, the economy has really um, put a seeming damper on it. I would imagine the same in film as well. Do you feel as though, um, this to either of you, do you feel as though the partic this particular time in history is, is any more difficult to break in as a director? Or, I mean, are these shades? of the same? Is this the same so story told with different words? I would say for the commercial business, it's always hard because, you know, our mandate is we're working for somebody. We're service side. So essentially, we d we're not responsible for the creative. For us, the creative comes from the agency. And we pitch the job. And if we win the job, then we go execute their creative. Um, I would say it takes you know, just the right attitude. Basically, what you have to say is yes. Like, if you want to be a director, be it in a commercials or in features or in documentary, I think the answer is if somebody offers you money to do it, you say yes. Sometimes they're going to offer you 10 grand. Sometimes they're going to offer you 100 grand. And to paraphrase Harmony, sometimes they'll offer you 50 million. Say yes to it all, because at the end of the day, it's a creative enterprise. The difference for commercials is we're the most inefficient form of filmmaking. Uh, it, what we spend in three days, you could do a feature with, which is sort of disappointing, but that's the reality of the committee decision. We're working for 20 people, and they all have a say about what color the pillow is going to be in the background. So we bring 20 pillows. But I think, you know, on the side, do it all is the real answer, and eventually you'll make it. I think the, the opportunity is as good as it ever was, as tough as it ever was. I don't know. Well. <laughs> that's fine. I'm going I'm to end on, on one question that's a little bit of a left turn, but it came from a conversation we had just before this, this screening. So, um, AJ, you were recently invited to speak at Trampoline Hall, and um, I, I hear you spoke about dead babies. Could you expand? <laughs> uh, I did. I don't know if anyone knows Trampoline Hall. 
Uh, it's a local lecture series where you have to lecture on something about which you are not an expert. Thankfully, I'm not an expert on dead babies, but no, the lecture was actually inspired by a film project that I am working on about mothers who forget their ch babies in cars and the babies die. And just sort of looking into how the psychology of that works. Is this just really, really, really bad mothers? Or is this something that could happen to any of us? And the truth is it could happen to any of us. So No, the right answer <laughs> was really bad mothers. No, <laughs> That's the no. Right answer. It could happen to you. We'll talk more later. I'll tell you how to avoid it. It won't happen. It won't happen. My, my husband's I know in that. the audience. It won't happen. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, it's very rare. It happens to, it happens to about 37 people a year in the States. Uh, but just the fact that it can happen and that it happens by accident, not because people are horrible mothers, to me kind of shifts the way I look at the world. And how does this fit, fit into the film that you're working on? Uh, well, I'm working on a film about a mother who forgets her... Uh, baby girl in a car and uh, sort of comes up with all of these excuses as to why it happened that weren't her fault and um, it slowly drives her insane and is kind of the uh, l launching point for this uh, psychological horror film. So you're a, if we were to typecast you, pigeonhole you, you're a lighthearted director then? Yeah. <laughs> I would say for commercials he would be a dialogue guy, visual storyteller. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your, uh, everyone coming here today, and that's going to wrap up the end of this uh, conversation. And I hope that you'll join us for future installments of Packaged Goods. Our next one is on July 21st, Thursday, um, and we're going to be featuring some uh, awesome 3D work. So we'll strap on some glasses and, and have an experience. Um, and, yeah, I think that we're going to go to the bar, so if anyone wants to come, that's where we're going to be. Thank you.